uh, Dr. Naresh Trehan, distinguished uh, uh, members of uh, the board of NIT University, the leadership team, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the 12th annual lecture of NIT University. Uh, the tradition of annual lectures began in 2009, when just after the notification of NIT University by the government of Rajasthan, Dr. Karan Singh, our founding chairperson and chancellor, delivered the first lecture on November 15th, 2009. Over the period, it's become one of the most looked forward to events every year at the NU campus. Because this is where like-minded professionals, thinkers, educationists, policy makers travel long distances to the campus and spend the better part of a Saturday in November. They together get immersed in listening to a thought leader on a subject that is on a subject that is very pertinent and affects the society at large and then engage in deep discussions on the same. They also get to interact with some of the brightest sparks and the sharpest minds at the campus, the Newtons as we call the NU students and nurturers as we fondly call our board members, leadership, faculty and staff members. The bonus for everyone is to get to breathe the cleanest air within 100 kilometers of Delhi, which as you know, is a rarity at this time of the year. This year also, we would have loved to welcome you all in person at the campus, but for the current pandemic. Nevertheless, we've tried to keep the same setting with the same backdrops. It's so wonderful to see that we have so many of you logged in with all other ingredients in the annual lecture being around, including Newton's and nurturers. The only thing missing today is the clean air of the campus, which I presume you would have ensured wherever you are. The topic this year has been very aptly chosen as building your future in COVID times. And the thought leader amongst us is none other than Dr. Naresh Trihan, an authority on the subject. While I'll provide a more detailed introduction of Dr. Trihan shortly, I would now invite Mr. Rajendra Singh Pawar, the founder of NIT University and the chairman of NIT Group, to elaborate on the concept of annual lecture and the context of today's session. So over to Mr. Rajendra Singh Pawar. Thank you, Vijay. And once again, Dr. Naresh Trehan, Naresh, to all of us, Thank thanks you. so much for joining us and a very hearty welcome. Um, you know, the very first class or lecture that was held on the campus, and we had decided this ahead of time, was a lecture given by our chancellor, Dr. Karan Singh, and we called it the first lecture because we just wanted to put that into the books of history that on that, that kind of virgin land, it was a little foothill of the Aravli, never been uh, farmed, never been just natural. And we thought that the very first lecture delivered there should be by someone of the eminence of Dr. Karan Singh, who was a founding chancellor. And, and that was a great lecture, of course. But then when the lecture got over and all of us were in the end of the day thinking about it, we decided that we would make it into a tradition to have a lecture every year, of which would be delivered by Dr. Karan Singh as he was chancellor and hopefully become a tradition for all times to come. But a lecture which would in many ways set the tone for what we want to do in the near term, but connect with our past. We were fortunate to have a, a fantastic 
philosopher like Dr. Karan Singh as our first chancellor. And for, as we said, for 11 years, he's delivered his talk. And last year, when he finished his term, we were fortunate to get another very eminent person as our chancellor, and that is Dr. Kasturi Rangan, the space scientist. And incidentally, he's the one who's also written the new policy on education, or he, he chaired the committee. And so we talked, and I talked to Dr. Kasturi Rangan as well, because he does visit more often. And he said that going forward, let's now build a tradition of bringing a person of high stature every year whose word should ring in the years of that campus for a long, long time. It shouldn't be just for the year or what's, you know, what's the thing today. And so I had spoken to him about many possibilities and I have to say that we concurred quite quickly that to combine the matters of great import today, which is unprecedented situation, I think is a good word that describes it, but also to see it in a philosophical concept, not just the problem of today. Because problems will come in society from time to time and some big ones and some small ones. And institutions which have to last forever should be reflecting on those just as small incidents in a long journey, but drawing some sense, some meaning and so when we spoke about you, Naresh, he was, when I suggested and he said, I was thinking of the same. I said, this is an unusual time that the world is locked into one agenda as the one and only agenda and that's COVID. But we know that, you know, this too shall pass. And in this moment, in this context, it would be good to hear about how one should deal with life one should deal with everything and how to make the best of a difficult situation. And so, if you recall, I had talked to you and I said that we'd like you to talk about whatever you want to talk about. It's your lecture. But three things, essentially. One is, I'm sure all our viewers would definitely like to hear your definitive views on what this whole thing is all about. And the science in it, the, the, med the medical issue in it, the, the issues pertaining to COVID. We all keep hearing this all the time, but hearing it in a cogent fashion would obviously be the first part. Uh, perhaps a more lasting, a part of lasting importance to, to me and to us would be a bit of your own story. Because you started somewhere, you reached somewhere and you you encountered all kinds of opportunities, challenges, difficulties, and you finally chose to come back to India, which I consider a very a item of great fortune for all of us. So your decision during this time and how you dealt with some of those, and particularly the difficult ones, and then give all our students and all our viewers a view to a philosophy of life. But then in the end again, it's very, very important that all our leaders in every setting give very pointed directions, I may say, or directives to the citizens to look after themselves and their people in this time. So in the end, once again, to just make sure we don't leave without remembering the few rules you want to give us. I think that would be extremely important as well. So this year's annual lecture has this different flavor that it's set in a very unusual context, but it will tell us about how we should deal with this and similar issues. And I have known Naresh long enough to say that he's a philosopher first and a doctor later, but he's many other things. I mean, he's, it's amazing to see the, the uh, range of interests, capabilities, competencies that he holds and finesses. And so, thank you so much, uh, Naresh, for having agreed to set the tone for our lectures post Dr. Karan Singh's series of 11 lectures. And we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. So, should I start? Uh, I I would uh, first like to give a short introduction to Dr. Trehan before uh, he starts. 
So I would first talk about the format of today's discussion in line with the new normal. We have converted today's discussion from the erstwhile lecture format into a thought starter conversation between two people, uh, followed by a long Q&A open to the audience. The audience may post their questions through the chat at any point of time, through the chat window at any point of time. They'll be taken up at the end of the initial conversation. And now I would like to give an introduction to uh, Dr. Naresh Trehan. Though Dr. Trehan needs no introduction, being a familiar face on primetime TV nearly every day, I would still like to share some significant aspects of his professional journey. In fact, the heart metaphor describes him very well. He trained to be a doctor in India and US with his heart set on excellence in cardiac surgery. While studying and working in US for nearly two decades, his heart still beat strongly for India. And thus he returned to India as a leading cardiac surgeon and co-founded Escort's Heart Institute and Research Center, a pioneering initiative in those days. But he had much larger dreams. Being a lion at heart, he took the plunge into being an entrepreneur. Dr. Trehan believed that India needed to have its own healthcare model instead of blindly mimicking the Western model, and thus was born Medanta, the Medicity. Two noteworthy features stand out that have contributed immensely to realizing his vision of affordable world-class healthcare for India. One, the Dr. Trehan, though trained in allopathy, not only believed but demonstrated through research and integrating traditional medicines such as Ayurveda and modern medicine, that modern medicine can be more, that this combo can be more effective and can reduce the healthcare cost by half. So at Medanta, the Medicity, there is a separate division, the Medanta Institute of Education and Research that carries out research in integrative medicine. Dr. Trehan himself has over 350 research papers to his name, many of them related to Ayurveda too. I have myself been a beneficiary of this integrative medicine practice and can vouch for its effectiveness. Second, that technology when harnessed correctly can speed up recovery improve collaboration and enhance a doctor's effectiveness. For example, access to MRI is provided to a neurosurgeon during surgery so that he can check in real time if the tumor has been completely removed. This is just one of the many innovative applications of modern technology at Mitanta. The journey of realizing his vision has not been smooth, but Dr. Trehan is not the one to lose heart, quite literally so, and has courageously overcome all the adversities. Hopefully he'll share some of those instances today. Dr. Trehan wears his heart indeed on his sleeve, as can be seen from the numerous socio-medical challenges he relentlessly champions for Mission TB, Free Haryana, Mission Stop Dengue, and more recently on containing the COVID-19 pandemic. He's a recipient of a number of accolades and awards. I will only name a few. He was awarded the prestigious Padma Shri in 1991 and the coveted Padma Bhushan in 2001 for distinguished service 
in the field of surgery and medicine, respectively. Since 1991, Dr. Trehan has also been serving as the personal surgeon to the President of India. So on behalf of all of us, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Naresh Trehan and request Raji to start the initial conversation. Raji, over to you. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you. So as I said, Naresh, first of all, all of us want to hear uh, from you uh, everything about COVID in 10 minutes first. Okay. First of all, let me thank you very much uh, Rajinder and Vijay for this honor. It is, it is indeed a pleasure to be here and be honored with this uh, lecture today, which of course is uh, uh, followed by Dr. Karan Singh, who has, you know, he's a different, different person of great knowledge, great philosopher. So I'm not even going to try anything go near him, but let me just yeah, fulfill what you asked me to do. Okay, so first of all, we all know Wuhan. We all still know, know that it's a mystery how COVID-19 started. When will it be solved? We don't know. But if you ask my impression, it is man-made. It escaped from the lab or was it made to escape? We still is an open question. So that's one. And the evidence that makes me say so is the fact that it was kept under wraps for the first four to six weeks. They knew it was spreading. They locked down Wuhan. The whole of China was isolated. And then there were hospitals that were already prefabricated for thousands and thousands of patients in Wuhan itself. So that the evidence makes me believe that there is something behind it which we don't know yet. Okay, so that's just a matter of conjecture. Moving forward, when we learned the first 14 patients who we got at Medanta were the Italian tourists who were detected with COVID in Rajasthan. And that's where our experience started with COVID. Of course, it was, it was not known that India will get it in such a big way. But what it did show us was that we knew very little about the virus. We had one thing clear that there were people who were traveling across the world who were spreading it because the RO factor of this virus, unlike the previous viruses, was three times that of SARS virus. SARS was also a very deadly virus, which was contained very quickly. This one spread so easily that it's, it went rampant around the world. And then it not only came from China, it came from Italy, it came from Germany, it came from US. So as Indians who were returning, and you will realize they landed in Delhi and Mumbai mostly. And that's where the first hotspots in this country were Mumbai and, uh, and, and Delhi. But anyway, that's still history. I must say that the government reacted very quickly. The lockdown, which was quite severe, was, was done in a very efficient manner. What it did was two things. I mean, there's still debate going on whether it was good or bad. It did two things. One, it delayed the spread of the virus. That means it put, broke the chain in between so that the virus would not spread as fast as it would if it was not locked down. Second, it gave, we also realized that we were totally unprepared for something like this because in our living memory, we'd never seen a, uh, a spread like this. It was then first epidemic, then pandemic, of course. But at that time, we thought it was an epidemic. Also, we realized that the treatment for this meant that we needed to have personal protective equipment, which was not seen in this part of the world at all, ever. Second, those N95 masks, we had never experienced. We knew they existed, but we didn't, never knew that we, we would have to use it in millions of numbers as was required. So it spreads from China and all the source of the protective equipment is from China. Now that's the paradox here. So anyway, what I must admire that the Indian ingenuity came, was very, very effective in the first few weeks itself. So what happened? Our garment industry repurposed itself to manufacture PPEs equivalent to anybody in the world. And now they're exporting to 135 countries. 
Masks were made very quickly. There were two good, very good companies who made them. Again, they are being exported, so we don't have to import any of that stuff anymore. But more significantly, there was an acute shortage of ventilators in this country. Ventilators, again, were being sold from China at exorbitant prices of somewhere $20,000 to $25,000 apiece, which was too exorbitant. We needed, needed thousands of them. So there, again, what happened was that there were a couple of innovators in India. One of them we were working with, uh, and we were actually perfecting their prototype. But the real help came from Maruti. Maruti Suzuki knew that they would not be able to manufacture these. And similarly, there was one in the south, which was adopted by, by, by the other uh, group. And we now had suddenly, by the time unlock, uh, unlocking happened, we had thousands and thousands of uh, ventilators produced in India at a cost one-tenth to one-twentieth of what the cost was in the world. So all these things happened, which, which demonstrated that India had the resilience. It had the innovative power. It had the ability to come together and fight together. Of course, our friend China was also threatening on the borders at the same time, but that didn't deter anybody. So I can say infrastructure got built. We got prepared for it in the, in the, as good as anywhere in the world, maybe some, better than some of the places in the world, because you saw what happened in New York, what happened in, in Italy. I mean, these were all disaster stories, but, and even today, if you look at the medical system in UK, if you're above the age of 75, they won't even give you a hospital bed saying that you're too old. If you were to die, you die. Now, if that's the kind of thing is happening around the world and India could produce this kind of infrastructure where we are taking care of everybody, we should be proud that India is a country which has a great future, period. It also demonstrated that there was a great uh, ability for the government to work with the private sector, with medtech industry, with industry at large. And secondly, even what we can be even more proud of was that the frontline workers, just brave hearts, they are the brave hearts who just pitched in there, jumped in, risking their own life, not having the right equipment even to begin with. They didn't even have the proper PPEs, but they, nobody that I know of shirked from their duty the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, the, the uh, paramilitary services, everybody has pitched in. So India is in a great spot right now. Okay, that's the good part of it. Now, understanding the virus. The virus is one of the most notorious. As, as I mentioned, it has an RO factor of three. That means one person gets it, he spreads it to three, three will go to nine, nine to 27. And there is a famous story of patient number 31 in South Korea. This was a lady who attended two church services one week apart on Sundays. She was singing in the choir and everybody who attended, I mean more than 90% got the virus because she was singing. It was a closed environment. It was a crowded environment. The air conditioning was not uh, effective enough to take care of the virus. So it told us very clearly that given the circumstances, given a super spreader in a closed space becomes the most dangerous environment there is. So they say that 50% of the people who got caught the virus eventually second hand, third hand actually originated from patient number 31. So that's something to keep in the back of our mind. Second, the point is that there were very early we made an experiment. It was done around the world which says that if there are two people, one of them has the infection, the other does not. If they are in conversation less than three feet apart for 15 minutes or longer, then the chances of the person who doesn't have it catching it become better than 90%. On the other hand, if the person who has the virus and is wearing a mask, even unknowingly wearing a mask, that they don't even know they have it, but they're wearing a mask. And the other person is not wearing a mask and they are still within three feet and still 15 minute conversation, then the chances become less than half. And if both of them are wearing a mask, still within three feet and still 15 minutes or more, the chances become 10 to 15%. 
So what it says is, if you extend the distance, it goes to below 5%. This is a well-established fact. So there is no, should be no doubt in anybody's mind whether the mass health, and you know the confusion in the early days, even the WHO made big blunders, and that's the saddest part. WHO made so many blunders along, along the way, misguided the people, and then we have our best friend, uh, uh, President Trump, who made it even worse. <laughs> so India, fortunately, the Indian government was very savvy about trying to stop it. Yes, there were some problems like the migrant labor and all that stuff. In the lockdown, huge economic problems have occurred. But I must say India has emerged very well from this to a level now where there are three things that you should, we should understand. One, the treatment. So over the period of time, when we delayed the spread for three months in India, we were lucky that in the meantime, the understanding of the virus was much better. The way it affects the body was much better. And what we need to do to get patients out of trouble was also much better. And then, so, so, and then came also the drugs, which were antivirals, who were, which were repurposed for the purpose of, uh, to act against uh, this uh, uh, SARS, uh, SARS-2 uh, uh, virus. The basic thing being that we, and, and you must thank the world for that, because this experience came from those places where the fire was burning much before India because of the fact that we were in severe lockdown. So 50 autopsies against the advice of WHO were done in Bergamo, Italy, where the doctors discovered that, that the thought that all the destruction was in the lungs and that's how people died because the lungs would not exchange oxygen was not entirely true. What they discovered was that this virus is so notorious that not only will it affect the lungs, it creates inflammation in the body. So, so much so that the small arteries that carry blood to the lungs, they get inflamed and the blood clots in them so that the oxygen exchange cannot play, take place and that's how patients die. So that means that first, we know that the first thing first is to build the immunity Second is to use antiviral drugs very early in the game. Third, to use a blood thinners so that the blood doesn't clot. And fourth, to use anti-inflammatories like cortisone. And there are some newer drugs like tocizumab so that the, this whole continuum used in the right, at the right time in the right sequence has actually saved millions and millions of lives around the world. So if you know that in India, the mortality is sub 2%. It is because of the fact that the first three months we learned from the world and then we were able to develop our own strategies in the meantime. And that today, I think the patients in India are getting probably better treatment than most places in the world. So this is something to be proud of. So we have heard about controversy about Pavipravir, the antiviral or Remdesivir, the antiviral, uh, dexamethasone, all the other things we have heard. But I can tell you, because we have treated thousands and thousands starting from the first patients in this country, that used at the right time, all these drugs have, have been very effective. So that is one part. So now, we, what, where, where do we go from here? Because the whole thing is that it's still raging. We still have not found the silver bullet. We have hope in vaccine. So there is a gap now till a reliable, safe, effective vac vaccine comes down the pike and it's available to in large numbers, we have a gap of three to four months, it looks like today. And this three to, three to four month gap means that we have only one defense. And that one defense is only the three principles we talk about, the masking and the distancing and the hand hygiene. So my request to all of you is that we know that in this past festive season, a lot, of, a lot of irresponsible behavior was seen. And that irresponsible behavior stems from the fact that young people think that they can get it and they will breeze through it. And, and so they don't have to worry. It's only the elderly and the children may have to worry. So there are two facts to it. One, that there are enough people, 20% of the young people who get affected 
will have very long lasting debilitating uh, effects on their body so it's not like such a breeze that you invite it it's a terrible disease to have your lungs get affected for life i can't tell you how many young people have died so that myth has to be destroyed first in young people's mind that is number one for their own protection the second thing is that they all have elderly and children at home because we have larger family structures so you have you have the responsibility if your parents you give it to your parents and they don't survive or one doesn't survive you'll have carry that guilt for the rest of your life that's the responsibility of everybody but i don't think people realize that youth has its own rhythm but that rhythm must be introduced today with a responsibility and reality of the fact that we are in the most dangerous time ever seen in the last 100 years so one point is that it's not going away the virus is lurking everywhere we have very good understanding of it so masking distancing and avoiding crowded places if you can practice that that's the best you can do for yourself and your family and your community at large and basically that's what's needed by the country today if we can have everybody or at least 80 90% of our people exercise just masking and distancing and just the thought in their mind we can lick this very effectively slowly slowly herd immunity will happen vaccine will definitely come along there are some very good leading candidates but it's still not sure how effective they are going to be how safe they are going to be and for how long the immunity will last last of the of the uh, of the uh, vaccine because this vaccine is a very tedious process it is to be injectable most of them have to be transported with, at very low temperatures so you need a cold chain which is uh, india doesn't have, even have minus 70 minus 80 except in specialized institutions like hospitals and and labs so we have a problem still which we which, which will exist for the next several months maybe year or two because to vaccinate our whole population will be uh, a, a sort of a, a gigantic task the government is preparing itself it is talking to civil society we are all involved in it uh, as as uh, as healthcare providers we are all gearing up we are training we are thinking of how to store it how to transport it how to make it effective but the ultimate point is only doctors and nurses will be able to give it give that injection so there are certain limitations so till that happens my appeal i will close with the appeal again please this is your dharma the three things no matter whether you're religious whether you're spiritual or you're an atheist or agnostic it doesn't matter your current dharma is these three things if you practice that you have served your community and the country so let's move on i think 10 minutes must have passed by now maybe longer i don't know it's a bit Let's, longer but that i think it's very important and very lucid no uh, but there certain there will be certain questions that will come in detail which i'll be very exactly. happy to answer later rather than i'm just giving you an overview right now because then you know what kind of vaccines are there what's the technology behind but i can go on and on the whole hour can go for that but i think i'll stop here and let there be more specific questions so let me now get you to shift gears and take a kind of an abstract view of coping with difficulties and in fact trying to make the best and in fact trying to see whether there's opportunities but i want okay. to talk a bit about your own journey and draw some parallels and particularly for a student community some lessons on how to deal with situations like this uh, and what are some simple mantras there as well from your own journey so i'll tell you from the very beginning if i reflect back i always liked working with my hands making you know in our days there used to be mechanos which is uh, lego now and if anybody asked me what do you want for your birthday it would be the next mechano next uh, step further so i knew this is a reflection now that i love to work with my hands and i was born left handed but in those days left handed was considered bad luck 
So my Hindi tutor broke my knuckles and converted me into right-handed. And my my handwriting went to pot. I mean, I sometimes have difficulty reading my own handwriting even now, but, but that's typical of doctors. They, they like to scribble anyway. But let's park it for that. I hated everybody for having allowed the, my knuckles to be broken and my hands to be shifted because this whole myth of left-handed is, is, uh, uh, is unlucky, was anathema to me. Anyway, we move forward. And like every child, I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to do this, but whatever. My both my parents were doctors, and both of them were, were we were displaced from Pakistan. So there was a three-room uh, uh, apartment or a, a flat we got in Connaught Place. So we used to be living like in one in one room, four of us: my sister, me, and my parents. And my mother and my father used to practice in the other two rooms. So one was an ENT surgeon, the other was an obstetric gynecologist. So. We had from the age, I mean, as to, from living memory, just this interaction with patients coming in and misery and going happy and all that. So I think somewhere in my DNA, it, it was that I would become a doctor, but it was fashionable. It was then, and I hope it's fashionable now, you always did the opposite of what your parents tell you. So my father said, don't become a doctor. You, you, you get no time to yourself. You'll be sweating and you don't, you know, all that, all that spiel. And I decided the more he discouraged me, the more I wanted to be a doctor. So that was the first stubbornness that, that came. I identified myself. Okay. Then I fortunately went to King George's Medical College, Lucknow. And over there, we were in excellent theoretical and practical education. But one thing that was missing, and we, I discovered it, the kicker came on one night. The one night kicker was... We, I'm taking care of a patient who's got uh, one of the valves, mitral valves, is blocked. The blood is not going through. The fluid is collecting throughout her body. Her belly was bloated. We put a catheter in her belly and trying to put the fluid back into the heart. I mean, and we used to have a four-hour rotation with a little pump like that. We just rotate it all night by, by uh, a, a turn and the patient would die. That was the thing that we knew what the disease was and we did not know how to fix it. Young girl, ladies were dying, young men were dying from this disease. India had very high incidence of, of rheumatic heart disease. But at the same time, when we were reading journals, we knew that in the US, the treatment had already started. There was operations now designed, although at that time, the, the death rate from those operations was 50%, but it had started. That's when... That night I decided, I'm going to go learn what I can and come back to India. This is just an innocent thought of a young doctor. I mean, it may or may not have had any reality, but this was the, the first light that came to my head that this is what I want to do. So this, that's that one night that decided that this is the journey I want to take. I want to be learn everything there is, bring it back to India and apply it to as many people as I can. Okay. So... Then, you know, basically what it meant was that at least I saw some pathway for myself. Then there is a, another very big realization that there is no such thing as brilliant or genius. These are all, it's, it's not something that, that anybody possesses. It is a set of circumstances that come your way, opportunities that I, I'm not, I, you know, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, I'm spiritual, but the, I'm, I'm kind of neutral in this whole field. But those opportunities do drop. And there is something, some force in the world that gives you that opportunity. If you can take it, if you can grab it, you can then ride on it. And... It, at every turn, if help comes and you don't recognize it, then of course you missed it. But if you recognize it, it helps you to go where you want to go. So it's like a radar of your, your personal radar. So what happened? I got a job in Philadelphia, King, Thomas Jefferson University, as my, because I wrote to 50 universities, I got this job from there. Anyway, that was one of the centers why I chose because it had heart surgery. There were not more than 15, 20 centers in the, in the whole of the United States that were doing heart surgery at that time. 
I saw the drama of this whole, it was amazing. It'll take a long time to describe it, but I'll tell you. I, I, had, I was in a general surgery program. I went to my chief and I asked him, I said, who's the best teacher of heart surgery in the US or the, in the world by that time? Because it's only the US where heart surgery had started. So he's, it came out Frank Spencer at New York University. But why do you ask? He has a five-year waiting list and he doesn't speak to foreigners. If I swear, if he had not said the last sentence, life would have been different. I just latched onto that, went home, wrote a letter to Spencer saying that I come from India. I wanted, I, I, you know, there are people are dying there. I want to learn everything. I want to go back to India. But I suppose it's all futile because you don't speak to foreigners. So that must have hit him because it's like I called him a bigot which was unknowingly, but I had. So he wrote promptly back. He said, no, that's not true. I love foreigners. <laughs> so the whole thing, right? So if that whole sentence, if I hadn't caught on in my head, I, I wouldn't have. So then he said, look, there are 32 jobs as, as a starting, because in, the, in those days, it used to be a pyramidal system. 32 is to start, four would become chief residents, and only two would go to become heart surgeons. So he said, 31 are taken from our own medical college in Harvard, which we have a collaboration with. There is one slot open, you can compete for that. So luckily, the guy who interviewed me asked me the question, which was the, my, my uh, like most curiosity. I read the Bible on it and that got me that job anyway. So then it went the pyramid and all that stuff. I became that they asked me to join the faculty. Now I had arrived as a heart surgeon, I was practicing in New York, as, as at New York University on my own alma mater. The point was how to get to India. India, that's when the whole journey started. I finished, I, I, I finished my board in 79 and I started looking. So that's when again, opportunity came. One day, Mr. Hari Nanda was was, had come to New York. He knew my parents and all. He said, Nanesh, uh, I'd like to see so I, your hospital and your and, and surgery also. So him and his son, I, I took him on a tour. And while we were going through the operating rooms, one, one of my seniors had, was having problems with the heart surgery coming off pump, which is what we do to, to repair the heart. He was having trouble coming off. And then I just made a suggestion which, work, which worked. And that seemed to, to go straight to Mr. Nanda and says, look, if you're teaching your, your superiors, I want you back in India right now. Let's, let's make something. I also want to do something for India. That's when the journey started. Then we couldn't stand, find lands. I mean, health came in many ways. It'll take a full year to talk about it. But that's when, when a patient was, had to be operated on. Uh, it just, I'll, I'll give you that. I think it's, it's important to fill this gap. So one day I got a call. I was in New York. Ramesh Bhandari was foreign secretary. He had come to the UN for, uh, for the session. He called me up and says, Naresh, he, he used to speak like this. He said, Naresh, Pistra Bando. I said, why? He said, we are going to Delhi. I said, why? He said, a very close associate of Mrs. Gandhi needs, has had a heart attack. You need to do a bypass. Nobody knows how to do a bypass. You come with me. And I said, where will I operate in, in, in India? He said, no, no, All India Institute is available. You do what you have to do. So we got onto the plane. We arrived here. I was a state guest because this was like a associate here. So with sirens blowing, I go to Panth Hospital. And over there we find the patient is on the ground. They are giving him his last, last rites, uh, Tulsi and Gangajal and all that. That was the second turning point in my life, from which was like divine you should get a call whatever i now you can imagine my my predicament is a big surgeon come from in, from us to save somebody's life and the guy's gone so i just felt his pulse he was still beating at 40 beats a minute and you could barely feel his pressure so i asked the chief over there i said do you have a pacemaker i put it in i turned it up to 90 his heart beats and this guy started waking up he woke up and then the family started to pull the tulsi out of his mouth and all that. It was like a drama which is still very clear in my head. Anyway, then we realized when we did his echo, that his heart was functioning only 20% and there was no way it could be done in, in India. So we flew him back to New York. I operated on him. He has survived. 
he came back and went to see Mrs. Gandhi with his traditional uh, fistful of roses. And she said to him, she said, oh, she said, Hare, you're still alive. I thought I, I was told you're dead. So that's when she said, when Dr. Trihan comes to India, please bring him to me. That's how the journey started back because when I, took, I gave her the whole spiel, she said, what do you need? I said, we need a piece of land and she made it possible. So that was the starting point of the return journey. Then Escort Chart Institute of History, six years later, we, I built it from ground up and I returned at that time. Now, two th from this is now 88, now we are 2003. We have created the finest heart institute in, you can comparable to anybody in the world, but no, no, that was not the important. I we helped more than 100 uh, other hospitals to develop heart institutes. We trained 200 cardiologists, 100 surgeons in the in those 18, 20 years that I was there. But in 2003, it became very clear to me one thing that we. India was, when I was growing up, was called a developing country or underdeveloped country, sorry, then developing country, then almost developed and suddenly in 2003 it began an emerging market. So puzzling I felt that look, they don't call us India because we are copycats. We are master copycats, including me. I went and learned something. I may have done many things when I come back and maybe evolved it for India, but otherwise the origin is copycat. And the origin lies in about 10, 12 institutes around the world. May it be the Harvards and the John Hopkins and the Mayos and the uh, Cleveland Clinics of the world, Imperial College, you know, that kind of institution. So that's when I said, if India is to be master of its own destiny, we need to create our own version of these institutions. That was the thought with which the concept of building Vedanta started. So this was in my head. And then, then again, it's history. I mean, this land was there, and you know, whatever, whatever, I'll tell you another day. But the point is, that was the kicker. So I, it's not like I had planned that I was such a, you know, evolved person that from day one to I wanted to do this or do that. These are things that happened. And then, fortunately, uh, a pair of, a couple of guys bought Medanta not Vedanta, sorry, escorts, and kicked me on my ass, threw me out. That was the best thing that happened. Because if it, that not, if it not happened, I was trying to do both things, work at escorts and try to create Medanta. So it would have never seen the light of the same for another half a dozen years. So the fact that they came and in their wisdom thought that they need to get rid of me, that was a great boom. At that time, it seemed like the heavens had fallen. But I'll tell you one thing. This is a friend of ours. When he first saw it on TV, he called me up and he said, look, don't be discouraged. And I, I would say to all your students, says the storm that is coming, and he's talking, this, uh, this uh, poet is talking to the eagle. He says, the storm that is coming is not to destroy you. It is com coming to make you fly higher. Those things still stick in my, in Urdu, is, is, it's very beautiful. The couplet is very beautiful when the way he recited it. But the point really is, it's true. If it had not happened, Medanta would not have happened the way it is. And now Medanta has happened and fortunately the rules have changed because my, my mission has always been to, the, I, I under, why, I, where, why Medanta, I said, I told you, but the whole thing was to create a medical college or what we call medical school in American parlance of the new generation. Because medical education is very good in India, but it lacks certain things on, on humanities, on relationships. And if you look at it, and if anybody is, is fond of reading scriptures, Gita has the full lesson, the, 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 uh, the interaction between Krishna and Arjun is basically tells you how a patient needs to be taken care of. How those five elements that are accompanying a patient. So we look at it as traditionally as doctors, as somebody who's got cancer, he's just got cancer. So let's address the cancer. That's not what he's coming to you for alone. 
he's carrying a huge baggage. And the anxiety about himself, whether, whether he's going to be living, pain, financial, family, the whole baggage. And unless you can address the whole baggage, you cannot be a good doctor and you cannot heal your patients the way you should. So these are lessons to learn in life. So that's why I say now that we have arrived, the journey hopefully, I mean, my incomplete journey was to make the medical college and that's what I was telling you. The rules have finally been changed. 31st of October, the new National Medical Commission came into being and issued the, the new uh, requirements and the fact that private hospitals can own medical colleges. This is what I wanted. Because otherwise, when you do it in a trust, you know, people were surviving by taking capitation fee, all this. We didn't know. I don't want to indulge in all that. So that's, that's what we are doing right now. So hopefully, before I fade, I will have built it and have the pleasure of having something like your, you are the proud, proud creators of a university. I think that's a great, great end to a journey. I think, you know, to, to spare that. So that's my personal thing. Now tell me whatever time is left, I will so, give you. So I think we do, uh, I'm sure there'll be many, many questions that I would have gone on a little, but uh, I think you have given some really good and simple insight, which you just narrated as a story. Uh, but I, I can clearly oh, so see one, that. One thing I forgot, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. That very tragedy that has happened in my life that they converted me from left to right-handed. The day I did my first surgery, I realized I could operate with both my hands. <laughs> so that was the biggest blessing. In fact, I went back to the tutor when I came from US to, to visit India. I went with all these gifts to him to say, thank you. I was cursing you all my life that the, you could see surgeons bending themselves up and down, trying to get stitches in. And I could just switch hands and keep moving. So... So that was a great, great blessing how it happened. But anyway, it so all I, goes back to the same thing that things happen in your life which you don't, you had nothing to do with and you can't claim that you were so brilliant. It's just a matter that you got blessed along the way. Sorry about that. Well, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we obviously can say that you got blessed, but I think you have to take more credit than that because clearly a couple of things came in Vijay after that we opened for questions. One, is that you are curiously looking around as you talked of a radar or whatever is happening. And to you, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, but something is happening. Number one. Number two, you took initiative. You did write to that fellow that, and you knew how to give your message and you don't talk to foreigners. So you took the initiative to hit where it really hit hard when the opportunity was there. And third, I think it's just fascinating is that every disadvantage, every adversity, you have worked at making it work for you. Someone could have said, I don't have a right hand, so I'm now, I'll give up. No, you saw it, you had two hands. So each of the adversities, when they, if you had to go from escort, you said, fantastic, now I'm free. So I think that mindset is unique and that perhaps is the lesson from your story, which you will keep Thanking the Lord for, but I guess the Lord helped those who helped themselves an old saying. No, so no, no. There is an addition to that. Along the way, if you have sincerity of thought, you will earn so much goodwill that no matter what trouble you get into, the goodwill will float you back up. That's a lesson that I've learned hugely in my life. So right now I'm reading the book, Think Like a Monk. So for whatever it's worth, it is really still, with all the what I've lived through, it still gives, teaches you a lot. So I, I'm a Buddhist, basically, at heart, and uh, believe in a lot of those philosophies. Okay, so tell me the now, next question. Yeah, now Vijay, back over to you, if you lined up the questions people are asking. Okay. Uh, the, can, I, can I give a two-minute tip on how that. to be healthy yourself? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Sure. So, how to protect yourself. I told you about the masking and all that. That's one separate issue. But ultimately, it is a question of your immunity. And immunity comes from muscle. The stronger you're and active you are, 
the more your immunity will be. So that means even in a lockdown state, do not become a couch potato. Always be active. Do your exercising. Yoga. If you, if you have a 10 by 10 room that's you're locked up in, yoga is the best you can do. I mean, you do 30 Surya Namaskars as good as, as, as running four kilometers. So you can actually stretch your body, build muscle, in, exercise your, your uh, pulmonary system. You do uh, pranayam. That's essential no matter where you are. So exercising, breathing exercises of yoga, then we say you must have enough nutrition, enough protein, because protein, no matter whether you're vegetarian or non-vegetarian, do not compromise on your nutrition. Then, of course, addition of vitamin C, zinc, you know, grandmother recipes like tulsi, whatever you like to add, that is all, all good for you. But enough sleep, enough exercise, enough nutrition. These are the three things you can do for yourself. And breathing exercises, like we said, will keep your throat, your lungs clear because the virus actually finds the host in the back of your throat and nose. So gargling with warm water twice a day or at least before you go to sleep is good. If you feel that you're getting a, a, like a sore throat or something, use 2% betadine gargle, dilute it one to one with water and gargle for 30 seconds. And you will feel that if you were getting something, it may protect you from that. So that's for your personal needs. Don't go to near your, your elderly. If you have somebody 80, 85, 90 years at home, please wear a mask when you go near them because they are very vulnerable. Even if you're carrying the virus, which is not affecting you, it could affect them. So those are the those are the things for personal protection. So go ahead. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, Vijay, all yours. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Trayan, that was absolutely fascinating. I think uh, you are very extremely modest compared to what you have uh, achieved and done. I'm sure everything was not accidental. Uh, I'm sure there was a grand design somewhere behind. Uh, <clears throat> having said, so I have a I have a bunch of questions. So. Let me start in the order in which you talked about your uh, talk to us today. So the question was, uh, if uh, first, what is the accuracy of COVID-19 RT-PCR test? Why serology test is not accurate for COVID-19? I'm sure you answered this on television oh. every day. <laughs> so RT-PCR is the gold standard, undoubtedly. But the way you collect the sample, that is by brushing the back of your nose, that is your nasopharynx as we call it, and then the tonsil pillars of your throat. In spite of all that, the considered accuracy of the text test, means your sample collection, is anywhere around 70 to 75%. So that means a full 10, 20 to 25 percent can be missed in spite of the fact that the virus is there. But if the load is high enough, usually you'll pick it up. So the accuracy goes up as the load, viral load in the back of your throat is or nose is there. Second is the way it is actually in RT-PCR, there are two, pro two processes. One is the extraction phase where you have a medium in which you extract the virus and then you use the cytoflobeter to see how what the uh, uh, what the CT score is for that. For that CT score, if we uh, different labs may have different, but the standard one is zero to forty. The higher or maybe even fifty to sixty it depends on what you. But if you if we say in our lab, if somebody is below thirty four, you start being suspicious. Above 35 means that is the, this is the dilution that the it may it, the virus is not there. So if it is in the mid range, you say weakly positive, and the lower it gets the dilution, the stronger it is. So that's one thing. The measurement of the viral load will be indirectly determined by the score CT score of your RT PCR. Okay. 
Second is the fact that sero serology is, the, the difference is that it only detects the first three days are blind. If it, if it starts turning positive, and it's, then you know that if it is positive, then you are positive. So the accuracy is the negative is the, is the problem, not the positive. <coughs> so you can miss it with serology. And the problem is the standardization of the kits. There are hundreds of types of kits that are available and some have been found useless, some little useless, useful, some very useful. So that's the, that's the other vagary. RT-PCR is usually accurate in its, if you get the standardized uh, material or, or the test kit, you're okay. But the, the sample collection and the extraction are the two critical. So that's why what will happen is that you'll find many negatives which are positive but sometimes they call positive if, they, if it is in the borderline or something and then you don't know and then you repeat it and it's negative. One thing I'll warn you about. People, what they do when they find out they are positive, they start gargling, beta dying, this and that. And if you collect the sample after that, you'll find that it's negative. So if you really want the true sample, do not gargle for 24 hours or you know to, to not to kill the virus because the beta dying does kill some of it. So anyway, that's one. Second question. Okay. Uh, then uh, there is one on if and when vaccine is available, should one go for the same immediately? And secondly, we believe Oxford AstraZeneca Serum Institute will be available to Indians before mRNA based vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna. Should one take yeah, so Pfizer, actually, Pfizer is talking about launching in the US uh, on the 11th because 10th is the big meeting of the regulator. So very possible that they may they may agree to it. It's it's got a big big problem with minus 70 degrees, 790 degrees. I just received a, a, a WhatsApp message saying that travel agencies are already packaging tours to New York to any city in the US. Two lakhs return ticket, three nights in New York, a shot of, shot of vaccine. All this stuff is going on. So you know the Indian ingenuity is already at work vaccine. before vaccine is out. Okay, vaccine tourism. So yeah. So I'll tell you to answer your your question directly. As I said, there are three questions: the safety. Normally, what they say is emergency approval is the fact that you have not given it enough time to establish safety in very large numbers. Because a phase three trial can go on over months in, you know, you could say a sample size for a vaccine, maybe few hundred patients, few hundred thousand patients who should be injected before you know three things, safety, the efficacy, and efficacy one or two doses, and how long will it last? Because if you look at the flu vaccine, you have to take it every year in the mm. flu season. So we don't know whether it lasts for three to six months or whether you need repeat doses or a booster dose like you have for tetanus. You have every five years, you have to have a booster. So we that will not be clear till we have enough history to it. You ask me personally, you know, we, I'm a frontline health worker. I go to hospital every day. I spend my whole day there. For me, yes, priority should be there and the elderly, yes. But I still feel that let the first few hundred thousand, few hundred thousand be, be tested to see whether it's really effective or safe or something like that. So what will happen? The first line should go to elderly who have comorbidities. And if it works, and that's what they're saying, the Pfizer said, yes, it works in the elderly and that. So that should be the first priority and the frontline health workers who are in the pit, who are in the direct line of COVID, uh, you know, treatment. So that these are our doctors, our, our uh, paramedical people, our technicians, our nurses. Yeah. So, and they are all relatively young also. So, so it will be a good testing bed to see whether they develop the antibodies or not. And I think today, if you look at it, 
the AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca, which is being manufactured in, uh, you know, uh, our friend from Serum Institute has already said 40 million he has already. I think that that is today probably the most advanced in its, in its uh, uh, phase three trials. Phase three trials, I mean, they are saying that if they have inoculated 34, 35, 40,000 people already, and this, the, all the data is not in because it's in 17 institutions in India also. So <clears throat> we will know the data very soon, I think by the end of December, early January. That's when we take this call, when you ask this question that you asked me, you, we could answer is better to say, yes, we know it's a two dose because many people did not get enough immunity from the first dose. So there is a booster dose one month later. Uh, I think that it is worth waiting for a, another month or so, protect yourself, the same old three mantras, and uh, hopefully we'll be, we'll be able to get it by the end of Jan. Okay, that's good. Uh, that's reassuring. Uh, when could we see herd immunity? Would it happen without peaking of the infection four months before vaccine? Herd immunity is a very elusive concept. First of all, for herd immunity to be effective, you must 60 to 70 percent of the population should have already got it. So you're talking about you calculate in India, if you're talking about 60 crore people getting it. I mean, God forbid, I mean, that happens, we will have a huge problem of taking care of them. So here we go in the sense that I don't think we should depend on it, but it is true that while we are waiting, some of it will creep up. Okay. Now we are also struggling with the fact that antibodies, if that is the measurement of your immunity, we don't know the history of antibodies yet. There are some people who have had very severe disease, will develop antibodies, and then the antibodies drop off a month or two later. So have they lost? Then there is a second line of defense the body has, which is called as memory T cells. They also are fighters. So they have the memory for that virus and say, I identify, I'm going to kill it. So these are all question marks, which when you ask me next year, we'll have better answers. Okay. I'll be in the audience next year, so you can ask me the question. <laughs> uh, I have uh, our president, uh, Professor Parimal Manke, having a question. Uh, can we open her, her line, please? Yeah, Parimal. Yeah, Dr. Trehan, it has been an extremely inspiring, uh, you know, talk. Uh, now, my question is, first of all, COVID-19 has shown us the dark side of interconnectedness. Now, what must we do in education and health sector in terms of shift in policies, investments, whatever it is, so that people at the bottom of the pyramid are better provided for? Thank okay, you. so I I don't like to use the word bottom of the pyramid. I like to say disenfranchised. This is a, you know, the, somebody's written, I forgot the name, Selden or something, a professor at Harvard who's just written a book about the haves and have-nots and how the haves not should not believe that they are, they are so brilliant that they got there. Hey, you know, it's just a matter of you are lucky. Some, by lucky by birth, lucky by many other things. So, so the point basically what you're asking me is, if you look at the healthcare uh, scenario or stack for any country, we are in a place where we are actually trying to do intervention at every level and say, there's a fire burning here, let's do this. This, this is happening, let's do this. But unless you plan from bottom to the top, and when I mean bottom to the top is not economic, it is the fundamental, India has very poor hygiene at the ground level, very poor sanitation. If we correct that, and whether it takes, it be a big priority, what we call Swachya Bharat, we would have disease, decreased the disease burden by 30 to 40%. That frees up a huge capacity then. Because if you look at the bed occupancy of government hospitals, 
a large proportion of these people are suffering from infective diseases. So we have a double burden. We have, a, we have communicable disease and we have uh, the life, uh, lifestyle diseases. Sure. If, we, if we take one eye on the, on the communicable diseases and actually concentrate, I'm sure in the next three to five years, we could eliminate a large proportion of it. Because when we were determined, you know we did away with polio because the whole country was mobilized for it. We have not done that. There are two government schemes, Swachh Bharat and Swasth Bharat, but they have no connection with each other. And then there is Ayushma. So mm -hmm. we need to merge all this and say, first thing first, prevention of disease. Second is early detection of disease. If we can early detect it, we can save huge amount of resources because then you would not be so sick that you will need tertiary care and big operations and stuff like that. And then you have a system which guides everybody from bottom up to the right facility so that it's not like everybody who gets sick reaches or in the institute or some hospital because they don't know where to go and they don't, they're not sure they'll get the right treatment for what they have. And the basic problem is they are too sick by the time they realize they're that sick or they've been bounced around by the local quack and then they have to run someplace. So I think that we should address this whole in a very holistic global manner. If we can do that and, you know, while we are doing all this uh, fixing along the way, I mean, uh, there are some schemes, there are this, there are that, with the dialogue going on, there is a lot of suspicion between private and public sector providers. We need to, we need to actually, and, and you are very well suited actually, to do a real string from bottom up to say, this policy, this is what India needs to do. And if I can give you some inputs, I'll be very happy because we debate it every day. So on one hand, we are doing what we can to, to fix the situation in the immediate term. But the I should be the five-year plan to make India's healthcare system so robust that it becomes an example to four billion people around us who are in the same situation. That would be the soft power of India. India can actually take the lead of creating a system where people, countries can follow us and actually let them benefit from what we what we create. So that's, you have the brains, we will, we have the ground reality. So if you like anything, we can, we can always, always uh, 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 share the information with you or assist you or whatever you like. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rehan. Okay. Uh, there's another question, which is more of frustration, which says, we've been in the pandemic for more than nine months. Why have we not been able to create and proliferate a COVID-19 testing facility at district and block levels so far? It's not entirely true that we, don't, we haven't. But you see, you must see that there are many aspects to it. Mm -hmm. Testing facility does not mean just taking a piece of equipment and giving it to somebody and say, go test. Creating a testing facility requires the infrastructure. It re because the virus, if you're going to test the virus, man, you better have it in a controlled environment because you go, you go open one in a shack somewhere in a village, you're going to infect the whole village and the whole environment. <laughs> so you need special training, you need special equipment, you need, the, you need to learn how to do it properly. So it's not possible to do it in every village. Yes, I don't, I think today, Hopefully, in every district, there is one. But in the sub-district, I don't know yet. So the point is, even Gurgaon did not have one till four mm. months ago, till United Way, we, we urged United Way to donate this stuff. It used to go to Rotak. So it costs one and a half crores to establish one unit. Now, there are 2,000 today in India, I'm told. So if there are 2,000, some, most of them, a lot of them may be in the cities, but but it is quite quite uh, available now. There are some mobile systems also available. So I'm not so sure that we are suffering that much from lack of testing. But the point is that we, the more you test, the more you'll find it for sure. But people who are symptomatic must be tested for sure. Okay. Uh, 
there are some people who have some post uh, uh, covid questions so one is uh, could i know how long does the sugar have a yo yo effect in a diabetic patient post covid okay we... i'll answer it in a different way <clears throat> because these are all questions which are related to one fact that covid has affected and we have found it in in medanta itself that in one of our patients who was not his kidneys were not recovering we did a biopsy and we found the virus in there the the remnants of the virus it was not alive it was a dead virus but that means that it travels to every organ it doesn't st- sit in the lung and we know that heart has been it has been it, it, uh, it has been uh, taken out on biopsies of the heart of patients who have passed away so the point basically is how it has affected a human body should be calibrated at 4 3 to 4 weeks after you recover before you go into full activity you need to get that so if this gentleman who has the yo yo effect of diabetes needs to be individualized and treated as an individual post covid syndrome mm-hmm. so there is individual post covid syndrome idea somebody's kidneys have been damaged somebody's lungs have been damaged but we have just created knowing that there are people who are dropping dead young people who had mild in, uh, infection who went back to exercise and drop dead so we have designed from those from those experiences we have designed the post covid return to health uh, checkup which requires which requires customization for everybody but it has certain principles behind it so like you like you said somebody's blood sugar somebody's kidney function somebody's lung function somebody's heart f- function so all these can be done in a very affordable package in in a 2 to 3 hour time where we have all the equipment lined up and it's just like a circuit you go through okay okay that's again very 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 reassuring yeah Then, I, and I, what are the chance sorry go I, ahead see uh, this question came up there somebody called me up two days ago this is my 92 year old mother who you saved is quite functional and she's sitting out in the sun does she need a full exercise test or something i said no she's not going to be an athlete she's not going to go to work she's not traveling internationally she can be okay i don't want to put her through all those tests but people who are going to return to work who are going to be exercising people who are traveling they should be tested and if there is any deficiency we find we can help to improve it now somebody's lungs are affected you give them the lung exercise much more intensively than you would give to somebody whose lungs are not in, not affected so you have to customize it <clears throat> what are the chances of reinfection after recovery from covid-19 okay right now we believe it is rare but then the not enough time has passed <laughs> mm. so we have cases who tested positive were not very symptomatic then did not have antibodies and have two months later contacted the infection and then had the full blown so did they really have it enough there were few viruses in their nose which we we cultured <coughs> these aberrations we find sorry for <coughs> this is delhi's pollution so uh, so we find that come to rana you... next time <laughs> yeah no that, by the by the way let me warn you what is the effect of pollution on on the spread so one is the the behavior pattern in the festive season the second whammy is the pollution what does it do we believe there is evidence to it that the virus actually latches on it's like piggy backs on the 2.5 particle 2.5 particle finds its way passage into the into the airway system much faster than than the virus itself now this is not 100% clear but this is the mechanism which we are working on and the worst thing is that the 2.5 carbon article particle also irritates the, inflames the lungs in, in and makes it much more fertile ground for the virus so that is why it's very important to protect yourself from the pollution as much as from the virus okay okay so what does it mean it means that when you go out you should be wearing a full mask 
Mm-hmm. No, don't say that there's nobody near me. Let me go for a walk. Excuse me. You don't know. It may be increase the virility, virulence of this virus. Okay. 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 Yeah, that I think is a very useful lesson for many people who go out alone and thinking they are they are actually fine. Yeah, yeah. No, no. This is this is deadly deadly material. You please try to stay indoor and try to purify your air around you. It's not worth worth risking. So another question, uh, Dr. Trian, uh, in an institution, for example, such as uh, your hospital, okay, in case. Uh, you have an outbreak of a number of cases, let's say within your within your system itself. Is there a way of digital contact tracing? Uh, because if anywhere it has been done, I'm sure it would have been done at your uh, your place. Yeah, you know, contact tracing is a good concept, and it has its relevance when the cases are far and few between. Hmm. It becomes an impossible task. To start, you know, at the numbers that we are having today, to do contact tracing, it'll be a it's, it's a it's a task which is not even possible to accomplish. So, right, you know, I mean, this uh, Setu uh, that, that that app, I mean, it's been it's helpful, but you know, over a period of time, they it loses because the numbers are gone all over the place now. 90% of the people who you say today, where did you get it from? They say, I don't know. Mm. I was, I've been so careful. I, I, I have uh, my, my help at my house is all, always indoor. They have no contact outside, but how do I don't know where the whole households are getting it. So it, it's a very elusive thing. So, you know, it's not that what we thought was easy to do contact tracing and do this and do that. It's not that easy to do today. The only thing is personal protection. Please, this is this is desh bhakti. If you wear your mask and you maintain your distance and you do uh, uh, hygiene, this is desh bhakti. If you want to do something for India, please do it. This is the thing to do. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> I, I'll just take a last two questions. Uh, there are many, many more, but I'm just taking two. One is how safe is flying and airports? How safe are airports? So I am. I was on the committee to recommend <clears throat> what to do for flying. Okay. So we studied it quite in detail and discovered several things. One, that the air circulation in an aircraft can be ramped up three times more than what it normally used <clears throat> because it's used to save energy that you don't want to turn on your full capacity. So first thing first, all the airlines were advised to go to full capacity. Second recommendation was that everybody should wear a mask and don't serve any food or drinks because they would have to take it down to to do it. So it's possible on short flights, but not possible on international flights. Okay. Then we say, okay, then one seat empty in between, mandatory. But if you're going, if you have so much load that you have to give the seat in the middle then that, that, that should be in a wraparound PPE gown so that your, your clothes and all don't touch the next person. Okay. So those, those were the things that we recommended. Gloves, if you sanitize your hands, gloves, it's better to do it that way. Gloves don't work that well. Okay. Shields do work well. So an N95 mask and a shield Try to avoid any drinking or eating. Do your thing before. Not using the toilet because it hangs around in the toilet. Somebody goes and coughs in the toilet, it'll hang around there. The particles will hang around. So, the, so try to avoid that. It's not possible to do it on international flights because we are 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever, whatever it may be. So avoid international travel if you can. Short flights are still okay. And the airlines have understood. Now, when the problem comes, which I saw, I was just in, I came back from Goa, that people will get off in, a, in distance and everything. But when it comes to the baggage turnstile, they all jump on each other. <laughs> so the concept is not embedded in our head yet. Then look, you can wait. You can stay away from each other. You see your bag, you go deep and take it. You're not going to disappear in a second. So those things are, I saw was being violated. 
and that's what what happens you are you're standing be waiting for your baggage and you're talking to each other that's when you spread so, i have to ask you this question because though we are running out of time uh, is there you didn't talk about ayurveda and what it can do for uh, treatment or prevention okay we did a study there's a whole concoction we we made and it seems to help recovery so i'll tell you one thing as i said about vaccine as i said about other things unless you do a prospective randomized study you cannot say with confidence that this is the truth because bias has to creep in so an ayurveda uh, ayurveda believes his stuff works grandmother believes her work her stuff works like kada is kada good or bad i don't know i don't have a clue but do i drink it yes i do so i'm saying <laughs> somebody said tulsi leaves i i eat six tulsi leaves in the morning so what i have vitamin c and zinc i don't know if it helps or not but i it, it, it's good makes you feel good i exercise that's my nature second nature anyway and yoga is my second nature anyway so those i continue to do now that's the best you can do and i and i'm a little i in my age i, I try to because i am in that lion spit on every day that uh, that yes you have to be careful and then some blessing somewhere that was extremely informative dr threyan i wish we could have gone on but uh, that would have gone on for the whole night because amongst other things everybody on television <laughs> watches you uh, and hear you but they never get to ask questions which are pertinent to them and i think today you handled so many of them so effectively uh, well, your humility your humility as well i i think you are more modest than you need to be uh there no, are but, uh, you know listen i i have a i'm a believer there are two diseases in the world which you don't want to get and one is arrogance the other is greed if you have one you are half dead if you have both you are dead so <laughs> it, it's not it's not to spare the world it to spare yourself because arrogance kills you doesn't kill the world i mean people will laugh at you and walk off greed again it's all your own disease it's got nothing to do with an, another person so i'm saying that if you can if you get stung by these two things it's a tragedy because there's no need there's neither need for arrogance there's neither you know so what as i just told you from the very beginning anybody thinks you have been successful is because because you are a genius is a it's a lie i don't believe that there is such a, there you know there are good people there are philosophers they can talk they can do but genius is going a little too far <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much i think you summarized it yourself for what is the key takeaway amongst everything else i think prevention uh, is uh, is number 1 early detection is number 2 and then making sure that you find the right place to to get yourself well, I, exactly yeah exactly. and exactly. on a on a on a on a on a light note i must tell you that i'm so happy that uh, uh, that hindi teacher of your hit your knuckles otherwise you <laughs> wouldn't have been here today and i'm so happy that raji did not have the same hindi teacher otherwise he would have been with you today and not with us really are you <laughs> left handed too <laughs> you left handed no okay all right no so 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 you know how i discovered first that i used to bat with my right hand and bowl with my left but i didn't pay attention i didn't know that it will help me in my surgery but it did so fantastic okay so a really real pleasure talking to you guys you know this whole uh, new norm has its own advantages because we are all sitting comfortably at home and then being able to chat like it's real time uh, you know so okay good thank you very much have a good good year and i will be leaning on you by the way i i am going to demand my payment you know that absolutely i want always guidance available. always available oh and also uh, parimal uh, asked Mante. very professor manke yeah. very good question so i am uh, you know this is an opportunity to redefine medicine so let's let's see okay what is i is there, you your is there a particular subject you you Uh, you teach or specialize in or is it like general administration and everything 
No, I, of course, I was teaching earlier, but now fully into administration and have been in higher education for decades. Very good. Dr. Mantke, were you, do you, did, are you related to Dr. Mantke, the famous heart surgeon who passed away? No, no. This question is, I'm asked very often, but not so. He was a buddy of mine. Unfortunately, we, he died of heart disease. He was a great heart surgeon, but he died of... Yes. If there were one or two doctors in India at that time, that was him, one of them. Okay. So... Okay, Dr. Trehan, thank you very much. Uh, I, really, really appreciate My honor. Okay, Rajinder. Raji, do you have a word to say, if you want to? Raji, you are on silent. Mute, mute, mute. Okay, no, I don't want to add anything. Just want to thank you, Naresh. It's been a wonderful, wonderful chat. Not just about COVID, as I said, but also about many other lessons for our young people. And uh, your humility and your um, sincerity and your integrity. We Personally, we know that. Many people in this uh, conversation know that already, but you demonstrated that so beautifully. And I hope our young students will be impacted by that because COVID will come and go, but these values are enduring. So thank you so much. Is Professor, is, is Professor R.C. Malhotra online? Uh, yes, he, he is there. He's there, yes. He is, uh, he is distantly, I mean, he's the brother of my brother-in-law, so. Okay, okay. Hey, Ramesh, Ramesh, switch on your video, man. I think he, he may be yeah. wandering off. Okay, all the best. Thank you. And Thank next you. time we'll have you at Nimrana, then you will not need to cough. There he is, Professor ah. Malotra. No, no. In oh, there he is, Dr. Ah. Ah, Professor Malotra is here. Hi, Ramesh. You're on mute. Professor Malotra, you are on mute. Okay. Anyway, I got to, got to see him. All the best. Okay. okay. Thank, okay. You, so thank you very much. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. And I hope we could answer most of your questions. Hey, stay safe. Good night.